Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, coming this evening. My name is Kathy Walter. I'm a 3L student here at Fordham Law School. Um, I'm also president of the Education Law Collaborative, which is the group that is sponsoring this event this evening. Um, and on a personal note, I'm very excited um, about this speaker, um, Derek Black, who I, I don't think needs any introduction based on the conversations I've been having with people as we sign in, uh, but I'll do a brief one anyway. Um, Derek wrote the book, Ending Zero Tolerance, The Crisis of Absolute School Discipline. He is a professor of law at the University of South Carolina School of Law and was previously a civil rights attorney. Um, and the personal note that I wanted to bring in is I am also a student advocate here in New York City um, for students that uh, undergo uh, discipline issues, suspensions um, here in the New York City schools. Um, and one of the things, and I was speaking to a few people as we started this evening, um, one of the things that I think is, um, I guess a point of frustration is when you're sitting there with a student um, who has committed uh, some infraction at school and you know that the infraction itself is something that needs to be handled. Um, uh, we can't have you know, mass chaos in our schools. On the other hand, when you hear the student's side of the story, uh, you can't help but be drawn into this line of work and wanting to help students um, to be able to advocate in these hearings. Uh, often against uh, very uh, high barriers and, and very high odds. Um, so uh, a few months ago when I, I thought about starting this student organization as a way for law students to become more engaged um, uh, in, the, uh, in the challenges of education, um, I was watching uh, a, the Tavis Smiley show and <laughs> lo and behold, uh, Derek was interviewed um, and I thought, why not? Let me reach out and, uh, and see. See if it's even possible for someone like that to, uh, to come all the way up here to Fordham. And uh, I have to say, I was, I was very uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, he responded back right away with a very gracious uh, ability to come and speak with us here this evening. So I want to uh, really extend a, a heart, heartfelt welcome uh, to Mr. Derek Black and to the uh, presentation for this evening. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Well, thanks for that. It's probably more than I deserve. I'm quite sure it's more than I deserve. Uh, you know, I, I think just the notion that uh, someone actually still watches the Tavis Smiley show uh, and reads a book uh, is, is enough for, for me to come out even if, even if I don't have much worth saying. But I um, also want to recognize the students here in New York that have been working on school discipline for some time. When I was a civil rights attorney, I guess I still am, working in D.C., it was a model that I can tell you that a lot of other jurisdictions wanted to replicate. Uh, students at Georgetown wanted to start a similar program in the D.C. area. Um, I've wanted to start one in South Carolina. There's a number of sort of structural problems that, that limits that. Uh, the student practice rules are not as liberal in some other places as maybe they are in New York, and I think that's, that's a problem. But anyway, I do want to recognize the work that the students here do, um, and, and I really do believe that, that you, that those folks that represent student and students in school discipline, are the last line of defense uh, for our students and are the ones that I really wrote this book for. Um, but what I want to do this evening is to, to place all this in context by starting by telling one story uh, at the, from the beginning of the book and then moving you through um, some of the major, I think, uh, fallacies that pervade school discipline and to talk about a, a couple of potential solutions to that. But let me start with the story that I start the book with, and that's the story of, of Benjamin Ratner, who's a middle school boy in Loudoun County just outside of our nation's capital in Virginia. Uh, and one of his friends came to school on a Monday morning and told him that she had a knife with her and that she was, uh, had been thinking about hurting herself. And this young girl had a history and, and uh, Benjamin was well aware of it, so he did what any friend would do and he asked her if he could have it. She said it was in a binder inside her locker. And he went there, he never saw the knife, he never touched the knife. Um, 
to this day, I, I don't know if he, he, he's ever laid a fingerprint on that knife. But word spread quickly enough, and he was called to the principal's office before lunchtime, and the principal uh, brought him in to speak to him about this. And two remarkable things happened in the principal's office. The first thing that's remarkable is that the principal asked if Benjamin had the knife, and Benjamin said yes. Remarkable that Benjamin told the truth. But even more remarkable was the fact that the principal asked if Benjamin would go get it for him. This is remarkable because the principal wasn't afraid of Benjamin. He didn't think Benjamin was a threat to himself or anyone else. Didn't think there was any danger with Benjamin carrying a knife down the hallways of that school. But the second remarkable thing was that when Benjamin arrived in the principal's office with that knife and that book binder, the principal said, you did the right thing, Benjamin, but I'm sorry I have to suspend you. Um, and then later that day, his mother gets a call and says, suspension's not enough. We're going to have to expel uh, Benjamin, or we we're planning on expelling Benjamin for the rest of the school year. And that, and that simple story, recounted in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and some dusty documents in, in a storage facility somewhere in northern Virginia now, is quite remarkable to think, how could we get to a place? How could we get to a place when a young person would try to maybe save the life of a peer and be thrown out of public school for it. I think much of that lies in the idea that we must always, always defer to school officials. And it's not my intention, in fact, to take that deference away from them. But I think it matters. It matters to think about where that deference came from, what the rationale was for it, and whether it still stands today. And in the early 1900s, it certainly was the case that our principals and our schoolmasters stood in the place of parents, that they acted uh, in the best interest of children, or at least on behalf of the parents for the children. And thus, it made sense for courts to not ask whether the decisions of school principals and school uh, assistant principals were wise. And I don't know whether that story is true. I don't know whether those Principals always act in the best interest of their students, but that was certainly the idea. But there was a tipping point, and that tipping point occurred in the 1960s when I think that things began to drastically change. Because there was a deal struck, and much of the South in particular, that it became clear that school integration was going to occur in places like Alexandria, Virginia, for instance, whether white families wanted it or not. And white families said, we will tolerate integration, but there must be order. Hopefully that doesn't sound new and familiar to you today. Uh, but there must be order if we're going to accept this. And so the deal was that you keep black kids in their place and we won't fuss too much about school integration. And the result was that as soon as African American and white children began to go to school together, the differential, uh, despair, the differential uh, application of school discipline began to occur very quickly. And that's not the story that you hear uh, quite so often when we talk of school desegregation. But if you go back and look at the school, the district court cases, you'll find it. You'll find the fights and you'll see 40 African-American children suspended and expelled and not a single white children uh, who was involved in the fracas expelled because they didn't know who the white children were. They told them to go home to avoid the madness. Um, but that story gets lost, right? Sort of whether we are busing or not busing students becomes the primary uh, national narrative. But a new narrative begins in the 1990s, which I think takes it to an entirely different level. And that's the intersection of high profile violence in places like Columbine and the No Child Left Behind Acts demand that students and schools achieve at higher levels or, sub or be subject to sanctions. And the result was a few things. Schools had an incentive to remove students who might interfere or not help them in getting to 100% proficiency by 2014. Um, but the other is that the federal government, even before Columbine, had mandated that uh, if you were going to receive federal funds, um, all schools had to expel students who brought drugs or weapons to school. Fair enough, I'm not going to debate whether bringing drugs or or guns to school uh, warrants expulsion, it probably does. Uh, but the problem was is that when schools were uh, said, while we're at it, why don't we make a lot of other stuff suspendable and expellable offenses? And so they began to include everyday misbehavior, such as disrespect, disobedience, disruption, not paying attention, the thing my son is doing now, the thing that all children do on a daily basis. 
In fact, one of the things I always emphasize is if a child doesn't do those things, we have one, at least one person with a PhD in here and dealing with children. If children don't do those things, you should probably take them to a doctor. There's probably something wrong with a child that's so withdrawn that they don't misbehave from time to time, right? And the question is, how much leeway will we give them? Well, not much, right? In fact, not only did schools begin to, and states began to uh, prohibit those behaviors or make them the basis for suspension or expulsion, they actually began to criminalize some of this behavior. South Carolina is now being sued by the ACLU because of its Disturbing Schools Act. It's been uh, reported here in the New York Times that basically, uh, well, I think actually the word obnoxious, being obnoxious is a term of a crime of a disturbing schools in the, universe, in the state of South Carolina. And South Carolina is not unique in that respect. As a result of these policies and of these statutes, three million students are suspended and expelled each year in our schools. Nationally, African American middle school and high school students have a one in four chance of being suspended by the end of the school year. Can you imagine that if you're the, some of you are African American, I don't know if you're parents of the African American child, if you told them there's a one in four chance that when you walk through these doors this year you will be thrown back out of them by the, at some point over the course, of the, that's incredible. That's incredible. And that rate is three to six times as high as the rate of white students, depending on the state and locality. We have some schools in our country that literally hand out more suspensions than they have students. When I began writing this book, I looked at some middle schools in Washington, D.C., with 500 students that handed out over 1,000 suspensions a year. That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Right? But the problem is, is it is so unbelievable that the conversation op often stops there. I think many advocates want the state or the Department of Education to sort of get down on its knees and repent because these numbers themselves must mean something, right? Uh, but real people aren't often swayed by numbers, at least not that alone. Right? And there's this sneaking suspicion or inherent bias or belief, whatever it may be, that we've got to get rid of these kids because they're messing it up for everyone else. If we let these kids stay in school, we're going to undermine the education of everyone else. And then, of course, there is the uh, bias and the belief of many that mm, those African-American kids, they just act out more than white kids. Right? So what are we to do? What are we to do? Right? So what my book tries to do is at the very least debunk those two theories. And I'll, I'll walk through that, uh, those two theories uh, with you quickly. The one is the race is pretty easy to debunk, to debunk, to be quite honest. The data over the last 15, 20 years, mostly by Russell Skiba at, at Indiana University, uh, has demonstrated that African American students are punished more harshly for the same behavior as white students. That's the data. But many discount the data. I think the best study came out of Stanford last year. And the reason why it was the best study because it was hypothetical. Researchers brought school administrators in and laid down written reports of what students had done. And the only thing that distinguished these written reports were the names on them. And some of the names were suggestively African American, suggestively white. But they did this, had administrators go through these files and tell us, what would you recommend? What would you recommend for this, this disobedience as described here? Uh, and what they found was that in this blind hypothetical, we weren't real students, but it was written reports that uh, actually the first time a student misbehaved, there really wasn't that much racial bias. Uh, in fact, sometimes African-American kids were punished at a lower rate than whites, which is quite interesting. I think is actually a testament to some of the progress of our country. There are a lot of principals and teachers out there who try to check their bias the first time a child misbehaves. But the second time a child misbehaves, the stereotype of the unruly African-American child is reconfirmed. Right? I'm not biased. I held my temper the first time, but this kid is one of those kids, right? And the numbers begin to skyrocket at that point, right? Seems to me the numbers don't lie. The studies don't lie. We have a racial bias problem that causes disparities in school discipline. It doesn't cause all of them, but it causes a substantial portion of them. The second premise, the premise that we have to get rid of these misbehaving children and make it better for everyone. 
Right? As long as we frame the issue as good students versus bad students, we will never have discipline reform in this country. We will never have it. Right? We will always err on the side of protecting the good kids right? and getting rid of the bad kids, particularly when there's racial bias baked into the, to the issue of who the bad kids are. But fortunately, and surprisingly, even surprisingly to me, when I began writing this book, what I began to see is that uh, there's a growing body of research that shows that suspension and expulsion have a negative effect, not just on the suspended student, but on the innocent bystanders. How is that? How could it be that suspending a quote-unquote bad kid negatively affects the quote-unquote good kid? Well, for the suspended student, we'll talk about that student first. For the suspended students, the outcomes are consistently negative, and that's easy enough to figure out, right? That one suspension begets another suspension, and it begets juvenile justice, and it begets dropout and prison and all of those things. But suspension also just doesn't work to fix the situation because, uh, as I try to explain, there are three major sources of student misbehavior that I focus on. There's others, but there's three major sources, at least three. The first are personal challenges that a child experiences outside the home. The challenges of poverty, the challenges of homelessness, the challenges of child abuse and divorce. That's one category of things that cause a child to misbehave in school. There's another category, which is academic challenge. The child is struggling to learn the material, and so rather than engage the material, they begin to divert their energy elsewhere. And then the third is a disability, learning disability, emotional be disability, behavioral disability. Those are the three major sources. So there's some kids that just act out, right? And that's just normal. That's just growing up. And sometimes punishing those kids works. But for these three major sources of misbehavior, the personal challenges, the academic challenges, and the disability, the problem is, is that a punitive response to misbehavior does nothing to address those problems. Think about the academically struggling child. Child is misbehaving because they're academically struggling. Take them out of school for one week. They're actually going to be struggling more when they return, which is going to mean it's going to be more likely for them to misbehave again. Suspension has done nothing other than make it more likely that they'll be suspended again. All right. But regardless of the underlying problem, whether it be disability or anything else, when we suspend or expel a child, we cause, we cause what some call a psychic break for the child. Right? That regardless of whether the student wants help, needs help, likes school, or doesn't like school, most students hold out, at least early in their educational career, the belief that these folks are on my side. These people are here to help me. Again, I may not want it, but they're here for me. But when the, school sent, when the school excludes them and ostracizes them, it breaks that connection. It becomes clear to that student that actually they don't want me. They are giving up on me, particularly if it's a suspension or an expulsion. Right? And so therefore, the one thing that actually can help a student behave better, that bond between student and parent, student and teacher, is broken for the misbehaving student. So for those students, the outcomes are negative. But what about the innocent bystanders? And this is something I'd like to focus on because I really do believe it is the fulcrum by which to capture a broader audience about discipline reform. Well, for the innocent bystander, the student who is on the outskirts just watching suspensions happen, the first problem is that if suspension isn't helping one of the three major causes of misbehavior, then it's pointless, right? We're just sending them home and bringing them back. We're delaying misbehavior. We are not ending misbehavior, right? We are not fixing the problem, right? The second problem is, is if we're not fixing misbehavior from the misbehaving student, the primary cause, then it has these sort of ancillary chaotic effects on other students, right? You know, you know how does my son misbehave? Well, he gets together with his buddy who's a little bit, you know, off track, or he's a little bit off track, right? That, yeah, you should have been at tennis practice this weekend. It was a thing to behold as just one child, right, wasn't engaged, and the next thing, all four aren't engaged, right? So if you're not fixing the misbehavior of the quote-unquote bad student, what you're really doing is, is incentivizing other students to become part of that. But what I would say is actually the most important uh, 
effect on the innocent bystander is that it actually changes suspension and expulsion as a primary tool of dealing with student misbehavior changes their experience of school. It changes their perception of school. Right? Um, it helps sever their perception of a, of a positive uh, school environment. At some point, discipline becomes too harsh, and even the good student rebels. I remember no one was being harsh on me, but I do recall my Spanish teacher in freshman year saying, Derek, you're a rabble rouser. You never do anything bad. You're just always back there saying stuff to get other people riled up, right? Uh, which was true. I only imagine if I was in a punitive environment, I actually had something to complain about. It would have been much worse, I suppose, right? Um, but putting that aside, right, it makes students fearful to, to see a punitive environment. It makes them disengage, right? When a school suspends or expels or arrests one student, it's arresting somebody's friend. It's arresting someone's brother. It's arresting someone's longtime peer. Right? And I often use the Spring Valley incident. I don't know how many of you saw this last year. It was in South Carolina. There was a, a young girl sitting uh, on the far side of the room playing with her cell phone. She wasn't making any noise, but uh, she was being, I guess, non-responsive, disobedient, something to that effect. And the school resource officers called in. How many of you have seen this video? All right, most of you. So, well, for the, for the few who haven't, school resource officer comes in and asks her to get out of her chair. She doesn't get out of her chair. The next thing you know, the, the school resource officer has her in a headlock, drags her across the floor, uh, and sort of choking her. And then the kids are, of course, moving all over the place. Uh, this is what led to the current lawsuit we have. But the point I try to make is forget about what that young woman did or didn't do, or what whether the officer was justified or not justified. There's not a single student in that classroom who left that classroom better off than when they entered it. Not a single one. They saw someone act with violence towards their peer. But not even that. Think about it. When mommy tells on you to daddy, or daddy tells on you to mommy, whoever the disciplinarian in school is, like, mommy's not off the hook for telling on you, or daddy's not off the hook for telling. Like, they're both in it together, right? And when the school teacher calls a law enforcement officer to come, and that law enforcement officer drags that student out by, by his or her head, they're both implicated. And that changes the way every student in that classroom sees that teacher. <clears throat> Fortunately, Spring Valley doesn't see that type of stuff that often. But Many of you probably work in schools or have seen schools where it happens far more often. And all students are affected by that type of misbehavior. So the misbehaved and the well-behaved students find their education undermined um, by suspension, expulsion, arrest. And when we understand that interaction and the effects it has on individual students, then the bigger connection to school quality should be obvious to us. It explains why, if we compare apples to apples, schools that deal with misbehavior through means other than suspension and expulsion have higher student achievement than schools that use suspension and expulsion as the primary tool. National and state level studies have shown that the suspension rate in schools correlate with student achievement in those schools. It shows why we cannot suspend and expel our way out of discipline problems. And it's a central thesis of my book that this data, that these stories, that this social science shows that school quality and school discipline are inherently intertwined. You cannot have school quality without a positive discipline system. You cannot have a good discipline system without a good school quality curriculum and supports. The two are intertwined. But when we separate them, which we most often do when talking about these issues. We miss a central aspect of school improvement and school reform. Well, that's enough social science. Let me tell you a little bit about the work that many of the students here and other places and advocates have, have done, which is sort of the legal side of, of, of my book. Compare uh, the world before Goss versus Lopez and the world after Goss, Goss versus Lopez. In the early 70s, Supreme Court of the United States and Goss versus Lopez said that students are entitled to due process before they are suspended or expelled. Before the Supreme Court ever issued those words, 
Students who filed a lawsuit challenging a suspension or expulsion had a 50-50 chance of winning in court. Ever since the court decided Goss versus Lopez, their chances have gone down almost every year. As somehow, though, the Supreme Court had fixed it by declaring that students are entitled to due process and therefore any student who follows a suit later must be complaining of some trivial matter. By 1993, the student's chance of reversing or winning a discipline claim in court, state or federal, was one in 10, right? which is remarkably low when we go back to the story I was telling you about zero tolerance. We've seen suspension and expulsion skyrocket and chances of winning go into, the, go into the lowest levels we could find. The only cases that you can manage to win nowadays are procedural victories or political ones. You can win in the court of public opinion and get a, get a school board member who wants to run for re-election and do something different. But save that, the only wins you find are those based on procedural matters. Right? So long as a school checks the box and says, I have told that student what he or she did and I have given them a chance to respond. So long as they have done that, there is almost no chance that a student will have his or her suspension or expulsion reversed. reversed. And for the most part, courts just don't take it seriously anymore. Benjamin Ratner, the boy I told you about earlier, the middle school student in Loudoun, Virginia, who tried to act to save what he thought was saving his friend's life. He filed his lawsuit end of, July, end of June, and on July 5th, the school district filed its motion to dismiss. So July 5th, motion to dismiss. Benjamin Ratner responded 13 days later. The school district then responded to that seven days later. And three days, three days after the district's final response, the federal district court for the Northern District of Virginia dismissed his case. No deposition, no discovery, no drawn out oral argument. Case filed June 8, case dismissed July 28. Changes in cable service can require more discussion than what occurred at his hearing. And they certainly take longer to filter through the billing cycle. I can tell you from experience. Federal courts normally proceed at a much slower pace than that. So, advocates for the most part have given up on litigation when it comes to school discipline. And turn to policy. And we've seen a lot of good policy in the last few years. The problem is that there are serious constitutional rights at stake, and policy will not protect them. It cannot protect them. That the politics aren't there to protect them. In the last decade, the last two or three in particular, has involved a lot of movement around suspension and expulsion. Eleven states have banned suspension and expulsion for elementary students, or at least the youngest elementary students. They finally admitted there's absolutely no evidence, no evidence that a suspension or expulsion produces any positive outcome whatsoever for an elementary student. There's just none to be had. So what's the point of doing it, right? To the contrary, it sends them on a more troubling path uh, of later suspensions and expulsions. And several states have begun investing in things such as positive behavioral supports, restorative justice. I know the New York Times has written a lot about those programs in the schools here. And those things are working in a lot of places. And we've seen a few positive cases. About six months ago, the Minnesota Supreme Court said that when a student, that intent matters. You cannot suspend or expel a student for bringing a weapon to school if they didn't actually intend to bring the weapon to school. The case involved a student who was a farmer and used his knife to cut the twine as he was bailing hay and he left it in his backpack and they expelled him for it. Of course, it can't do that. Had, intent matters, right? The problem is, however, that these are so rare and that the policy, the policy shifts at the federal level, the state level, are entirely voluntary and not big enough. Take the elementary school ban, for example. I think the first question we should ask is why in the heck were they suspending, suspending or expelling students in the first or second grade to begin with? I don't know. I, I don't know. But I'm certainly not going to pat them on the back for prohibiting those behaviors. Because they've done nothing to stop suspension and expulsion in middle school and high school, 
which is where the lion's share of it occurs, right? So yes, we've seen some states parade around and talk about all the progress they're making, but it's, it's very small progress. The Office for Civil Rights guidance that came out three years ago. Uh, the problem there was, unfortunately, the only inroad for the federal government was in regard to racial bias. And so, that, so if it was the case that a school district had enormously high suspension and expulsion rates, so long as they were suspending and expelling African Americans and whites and Latinos and Asians at the same rate, there'd be no federal issue. Right? So that the idea of simply making everyone suspended equally doesn't fix the problem if suspension and expulsion itself is inherently problematic. That's not a critique of the prior administration. It's just an indication of how limited that policy really was. The real problem is when we rely on policy rather than constitutional rights is that it only lasts, or it may only last for so long. We have a new administration now. I guess I don't need to repeat that. But it is worth noting that um, about two weeks ago it withdrew, for instance, it's, it's uh, the policy guidance on transgender youth right, who thought they had rights and now they don't, at least from the perspective of the Department of Education. And in fact, today, for those of you who haven't seen it yet or heard about it, I saw it on some ticker tape downtown, right, that the United States Supreme Court has decided it will not hear Gavin Grimm's case out of Gloucester, uh, Virginia, uh, largely in part because the Trump administration has uh, eroded one of the premises of bringing the case to the Supreme Court to begin with. Right? And I can tell you, almost assure you, that uh, the enforcement of the discipline policy will not occur under this administration. Right? Whether they will withdraw it, formally reverse it, take it down, I don't know. It won't be enforced. And we've seen this before. Right? So our children cannot rely upon well-meaning political actors to protect them over the long term. Right? Courts are the only ones, are the only ones that can stand up and enforce constitutional principles across time, or at least set the baseline. I mean, it takes a federal government to enforce them. But it takes courts to set a baseline. So I lay out three theories of reform in my book, and I'll walk through them quickly, uh, and then we can get to some, some questions and answers. Hopefully some answers. We'll take some questions. We'll see if there's any answers to be had. But, uh, so the first is that uh, the Constitution, the federal Constitution, limits or I should, I always leave out the word should. The federal Constitution should limit irrational discipline. Right? And I argue that for discipline to be rational, schools must consider uh, at least three or four things. The first is intent. It matters what the student's intent was. It matters whether a student intended to bring his knife to school or he just left it in his backpack when he was out on the farm. Right? It matters. Culpability matters. You've, for those of you who are law students, you've all had contracts, right? Children can't engage in the same contracts that adults can, right? The mentally uh, insane are not culpable for the same things that those who are sane are culpable from. You look in any area of the law, culpability matters. And if it matters in all those other contexts, it must matter in education. And of course, children are inherently less culpable than adults. <clears throat> the third thing that matters is the seriousness of the misbehavior. And I think this is probably where <clears throat> courts have gone astray. I don't think it's that hard to convince them that intent matters, that culpability matters. We've got some outlier cases that recognize that. But I say that the seriousness of the misbehavior must matter as well. Would we really allow a school district to say, we have decided henceforth that it is better for Americans to write with their right hands as opposed to their left hands? And any child caught writing with their left hand shall be suspended. And any child caught writing with their left hand more than three times in a year shall be expelled. Now, it is certainly the case that a school could adopt the policy mandating writing with your right hand. And there is nothing any of us could do except for go to the ballot box over it and the school board meeting. But transforming that into an suspendable or expellable offense is an entirely different thing. I don't know that we've suspended anybody for something as minor as writing with their right hand. But when you consider the lack of intent and the low culpability, it gets darn close sometimes, right? There, were, there was a kid, Maryland did change their policy. I don't know if you guys read about this. I talk about it a little bit in the book. But there was a spat of, of discussions about guns in Prince George's County a year and a half ago. Uh, and one young man chewed a Pop-Tart into the shape 
of a gun. And he got suspended for that. Now, there, there was some back and forth this past year saying, well, he's a troubled kid, and he'd been doing lots of stuff, and you don't know all the other stuff he had done. And that's fine. But certainly chewing a Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun is not the straw that breaks the camel's back, at least it seems to me. Right? Circumstances matter. That if you have school discipline policies that ignore intent, that ignore culpability, that ignore the seriousness of the misbehavior, and ignore the circumstances of the so-called crime or misbehavior, then it's irrational. There's no other place in the law that we would ignore all four of those things. The second theory of my book is that because there is a constitutional right to education at stake, the state must have a good reason for taking it away. And on this point, I draw on school finance litigation and over half the states that have recognized that either the state has a constitutional duty to provide an education or that students have a fundamental right to an education. And so I argue, look, you know, apply simple, strict scrutiny, or even intermediate scrutiny, right? The state has to have a good reason for taking away constitutional rights. When Goss versus Lopez was decided, education had not been declared a fundamental right or a constitutional right in state courts. I say that that matters, right? And even if states have a compelling interest, and I think this is where they get into trouble, the response to student misbehavior must be narrowly tailored, right? So if there's a way to deal with the misbehavior other than through suspension or expulsion. The school ought to try that, ought to be required to do that. The third argument I make, and this comes back to sort of my, my point about the connection between quality and school discipline. Uh, the third argument is that when overly harsh discipline policies undermine the quality of education in a school, all students in that school, not just the suspended ones, all students in that school have a claim against the state. Right? And such a claim would track much of the, sim much of the uh, claims that we've seen in other school quality cases and school funding cases. So it's my hope in writing this book was first just to shed a little light on the reality of things and by doing so to uh, spur activity where there has been none. For the conscientious school board member, uh, my hope is that they see how ineffective, completely ineffective, suspension and expulsion is for dealing with student misbehavior and that their students actually have some rights at stake, that this is not a matter to be handled by fiat, by school administrators. And for, ad for advocates, my hope is that we will uh, make it our civil rights mission to shift and involve the law so that our students' rights to an education, a constitutional education, are once again uh, respected in the context of discipline as it's handed out on a daily basis, and by the courts, should, should we get there. So thank you for listening. That's a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, thanks, thanks for your attentiveness. Happy to answer any questions you have. I just want to let everybody know that we are recording the event this evening. So we have an extra microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll come over with a microphone. We just want to make sure that the recording picks up the question as well as the actual answer. So, does anybody have, want to be the daring soul to ask the first question? Okay. Thank you. Hi. My name is Deirdre. Um, I'm a charter school teacher. I heard you guys kind of talking about charter schools a little bit in the back. And I'm wondering, is there any difference in, I guess, the way that Charter, which, yes, has like public funding, also for mines, private funding, and also like private schools. Um, I, I'm hearing you're saying these are constitutional rights to education, but the way that, I guess, like administrators in these schools would deal with suspension, expulsion, do they have kind of more leeway in kind of like doing what they want to do, or is this something that you want to bring more to, um, like federal courts or, um, yeah, I, I mean that, that that's a real question, I'm sorry. Sure, <laughs> no, I think that that's an excellent question and I, I think the answer depends on who you ask, um, which, which is unfortunate, uh, or maybe where you're at. But to, to go straight to the point, um, there's a little bit of a problem in terms of how we frame the question with charter schools. And so there's a California case, for instance, decided about two years ago that says, well, charters are a school of choice. Uh, and when a student is suspended or expelled from a charter, they haven't actually lost their right to attend school because they could still go back to their traditional 
public school. Um, I, I guess that is, uh, I guess that's correct, although uh, state law may place some limits on that student's ability to return to, to a regular school. But there, but the, the key point there is for due process to be triggered, constitutional process, there has to be a deprivation of some life, liberty, or property. And property is typically meant, means the right to go to school. And so some courts have said, look, kicking you out of a charter school doesn't deprive you of the right to school because you can still go back to your regular school. I think that's problematic. I think that's highly problematic um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, you can take the same rationale and apply it to uh, transferring to an alternative school. Now, when Goss versus Lopez was decided, there was no such thing. Well, maybe there was in a few places, but in large part, there was no such thing as an alternative school. You were suspended or expelled. You went home, and you stayed there until you returned or transferred somewhere else. There are a few lower court cases that have said, well, as long as the school is providing an alternative school for you, they haven't actually deprived you of your education. And therefore, again, due process doesn't apply. Now, I think, uh, and not just me, some others think that that's highly flawed reasoning, and these are lower courts, these are not state supreme courts. For instance, there's a um, handful of state supreme courts, at least in regard to alternative schools, that, that look at them pretty rigorously. I imagine that if a charter school, I don't know what they would do with a charter school case. I mean, it is different insofar as the child has made a choice to go there. Um, I would respond that it seems to me to be anomalous, however, for on the one hand, to treat a charter school as a traditional public school, which doesn't create any, I don't want to get too technical, but doesn't create any constitutional problems by setting up a, an alternative system that would violate the Constitution, right? So the reason that they are part of the public school system, but yet when you get thrown out of a charter school, you haven't been thrown out of the public school system. I just wanted to you could spark something in the Sure. Yeah, no, that, well, that is interesting. So, uh, so there's no, uh, is, it, is it a school designed for children that are specifically well, experiencing discipline? Our own children's home, which is a school, it's basically, if you live in the particular area of our own. Sure, yeah, I'm familiar with it, yeah. yeah. So it's not like um, income green or anything like that. So a lot of, not a lot, but we have a decent amount of smaller Well, I, know, I mean, you're coming at it from an entirely different perspective. When you raised that question, I was thinking of uh, charter schools in Louisiana that, that uh, completely exclude about 35% of their student population. And if we took this idea that no due process applies, um, that would give them an enormous amount of discretion to basically sort their student population. I mean, they're prohibited from having admissions policies that are discriminatory or cream off certain students, but if you allowed them on the back end to push students out one out of three that they didn't want, um, the only real check on that, it seems to me, would be the application of some more rigorous form of due process. It seems your, your, your situation is sort of the opposite of that, which is you're taking some of these kids that, that no, no one else wants, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've, I've heard that argument on the other side where uh, there's a concern among uh, people who are talking about this subject, that um, charter schools are kicking out a number of students on that other side. They're opening their lotteries and they're kicking people out. But I think it honestly depends on the state because each state has a different set of charter school laws and how they set up those things. Um, and I think it also depends on the districts that those charter schools sit in and what type of policy they may have set with the charter schools. So I, I think it gets even more, we were talking earlier about this idea that education is often decentralized. And I think that sometimes makes this discussion even harder to have because it's not like we can say at a federal level, here's what everybody should be doing because each of the individual states has their own way of doing things. Yeah, another question. Hi. Um, my name is Janan. I'm a 2L student. I'm actually working on a project related to restorative justice at the moment, so I was very excited for this talk. Um, I'm going to summarize what I think one of your arguments is and then ask you a question about it. So if I've misunderstood you, please correct me. Um, I believe that I can summarize part of your argument as 
that school discipline should have a rational basis and that four criteria that you've identified for what could be part of a rationally designed school discipline would be student intent, student culpability, the seriousness of the misbehavior, and the circumstances of the misbehavior. And I'm wondering why you did not include in a rational discipline um, the educational value of the applied punishment or treatment? That's a good question. I guess what you really belie is my belief, uh, which I think is, is founded in, in the social sciences, there is no value to be had of suspending uh, or expelling a student unless what we have is a situation where they actually are posing a risk to themselves or others in the school environment. Um, and so I think that intent, circumstances, culpability help us distinguish between the student who actually presents a danger or doesn't present a danger to him or herself in the overall school environment. Thank you. I'm Aaron Sager. I work here at Fordham Law. I, this may be a slightly inside baseball question, but uh, it's been a while since I read Goss Against Lopez. But my memory of Goss Against Lopez was that the Supreme Court was trying to draw a line between serious deprivations of the property right to go to school and trivial ones. So that if you're going to be suspended for a long time, you get full, something much closer to full dress due process. It's only these shorter suspensions where you get the pro forma, I heard you and no kinds of interviews with the principal. Why aren't your guns aimed at that line drawing exercise? And why aren't you out there pushing that, which seems much more of a straightforward legal theory, that they just drew the line in the wrong place and that since suspensions are not effective, and don't work, the line should be at suspension rather than, it's, than at suspension for 10 days while leaving Goss in place for restorative justice and after school detention and banging the erasers and whatever, God, whatever the professionals in the room know what else they do these days that are, is not as destructive. That just seems easier and straightforward and less of a break with current law and that it would do most of what you want it to do. So I'm curious why it hasn't. Yeah, I, that's, that's a very insightful question, not, not, in, not insider baseball. I think the answer to that, I think when I first began looking at this subject, I thought, let's get some more process. Let's, let, that's what lawyers do, make the process more rigorous. Let's get some more cross-examination in there. Let's have some transcripts and then we can appeal it and follow. And you know, the, the more I, I, I thought about it and looked at it was that more process will not fix this problem. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the scholar's name, but she was writing not in an education context, but sort of one of the way that she framed it is that process, exorbitant process, is the thing that actually lets the king do whatever the king wants. Because the more process we give, the more legitimacy we give to the punishment, right? They've, we've all seen it, we've all heard it, we've all argued about it. Um, and you had your process, and so we're done with you, Aaron. We're, we're expelling you. Um, and now your plight is even worse, right? Because everyone else who's, well, the school, everyone's looked at it. What's, what's Aaron upset about? And so I think my argument is really sort of the idea there actually has to be limits on the basis for suspension and expulsion itself because more and more process won't fix the problem. Now, I could be wrong on that. That, it, that is a speculation on my point. But it does come from, um, I, I think, that that sense of mine comes from the reality that schools provide a lot more process today than they ever did before and they suspend and expel three million students a year for not doing much. Um, and um, so more process isn't going to fix it. Now what you could do, and I had thought about this a bit, which is if you imposed a rigorous form of, and this is more strategic and maybe to your point, a rigorous form of process on the short-term short term suspension, it would disincentivize it to begin with. Um, I mean, that's possible. That, that, that is possible, and I would allow that possibility. Um, but I also argue in the book that the solution is not to simply stop suspending or expelling students. If that's all we do, we actually haven't fixed anything either, right? That we have a problem with what we define as being problematic behavior and how we respond to it. And so unless we really are using discipline as a teaching tool, not a punitive tool, um, simply taking the harshness off of the punitive nature of it doesn't fix the problem. But, but I think I, 
But I think you're certainly right. There's a strategy to be had in, in your question. Hi, my name is Melody, um, and I'm part of an organization called the Yaya Network. We're part of the Coalition Dignity in Schools that works on um, eliminating suspensions, um, the role of police in schools, and um, metal detectors, things that criminalize young people of color. Um, but I'm also involved, my, my family is involved in some litigation, and we're in the Syracuse uh, School District. And my fiance's little brother has autism and was diagnosed very young and was being denied FAPE, um, free and appropriate public education. And um, as a result of that, was being suspended, being like, criminalized, being treated, and um, the school environment was very unsafe for him. And so we're now still in litigation with them. Actually just filed, went through this, going through the second due process hearing. Um, the district originally settled for uh, $150,000. And have now kind of like take that, taken that away through some like procedural thing. Um, so I'm just wondering like what feedback you have around litigation that not just only involves like an unfair suspension situation, but also the denial of faith. And this is a student who's now has been homebound for a couple of years and is like years behind already with the disability that creates that that difficulty. Well, my first, you know. Thanks for share, sharing uh, that that story. My guess is that you've got someone uh, who probably uh, knows as much or, or more about the special education discipline connection as I do, and I wouldn't second guess that problem. I know that even in my own house, I know I'm, I'm second in line on that. My wife uh, runs a special education clinic and uh, has got an article out on, or coming out soon, hopefully on the exact issue you're talking about. So mostly what I'm gonna say is my wife's work rather than my own. Um, and, and I think the, the challenge there is I understand from, from her work, and if you give me your, your contact information afterwards, I'd be happy to ask her to share that with you. But um, the, the way in which a, uh, when we get to the, the way in, FAPE and discipline are sort of analyzed under two different frameworks so that often it is the case, I won't get too technical to bore others, but often it is the case that one of the reasons why a student is having behavioral problems, uh, a special education student is having behavioral problems is because the school is, not, school is not actually discharging its FAPE requirements. Now theoretically, theoretically you can raise that uh, defense in the manifestation behavior hearing, but uh, and I just want, I'm going to soften it for, for, for the other listeners here. The way in which they narrow the scope of the inquiry in those, uh, in those appeals of those hearings uh, severely disadvantages uh, the student. The burden is on the student uh, as opposed to the school district, even though the school district has the affirmative duty to provide FAPE. So one could question whether it's appropriate for the burden to fall on the student. Uh, and the other one is, is that if what you're really doing is challenging the invalidity or the ineffectiveness of the IEP itself, that what you can do is file a separate claim, which is maybe what you're doing at this point, a separate FAPE claim. But the problem is, you're suspending or expelling me right now, and the idea that I'm going to go file a separate proceeding to sort out FAPE, um, you know, disaggregates the issues in a way that's maybe logical, but doesn't serve the interests of the child. That's what I take from my wife's research on that. I'm, I'm happy to... To, to have her maybe provide a little bit more insight, though. Hi. Um, so given, speaking to the idea that education is very decentralized and depends on individual states and individual school administrations mm -hmm. and school staff, um, I'm just curious what your thoughts and experiences are on equipping marginalized students and families with the tools and information they need to advocate for themselves when a situation arises, how do they know what kinds of policies their district or their state has in place and what steps they have a right to take and things like that? So kind of from the family and student side. Yeah, so I, uh, when I was at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, I started a program called PREP, Parental Readiness Empowerment Program, I think it was. And so uh, that was mostly what we did was try to inform parents about special education and discipline so that they could protect those rights in school. Um, that program, I'm not involved with it anymore, but it's still ongoing. I'm, hopefully there's some here in, in, in New York, but it, you know, I think that those type of programs are important. Um, I, I'm always, 
it's always important for people to have knowledge, but I'm also worried about um, people who sometimes find a way to leverage that knowledge in a way that doesn't work so well. So there was a gentleman one time in, in, uh, in Georgia that we had worked with, and uh, he was really passionate about this issue, and he determined that the best way to keep students from getting um, uh, suspended or expelled was to go to their hearing and claim they had a disability and try to get a, a special education proceeding started. He had no basis for knowing one way or another. Way. He was right that as a matter of strategy that would slow it down, but I'm not sure that that got the right, well, I don't know. It's hard for me to sit here and second guess, you know, but, um, but there is this sort of, there is a, unfortunately, particularly with special education, I mean, she asked a question that I myself couldn't even fully answer quickly and easily. And so when you get into special education, it gets so technical. The idea that we would leave, uh, you know, parents to, to their own there is difficult. And then, you know, in the context of, of school discipline, you know, with marginalized communities, what I've seen uh, lots of times is that the discipline of the student actually leads to a problem for the parents as well because these parents may not have had a good relationship with the schools themselves when they were there. They're now upset that they see their children being sent that way. So it is not unusual in my experience to see a parent ending up with a uh, restraining order on them because of their attempt to uh, advocate for their children, uh, particularly you know, communities of colors that, that try to advocate for themselves. And so I think it's important for them to have that knowledge. I think it'd be a mistake to think that, that, um, that the powers that be are, are necessarily responsive to, to that knowledge. One thing I can tell you about the New York City schools, um, for better or worse, when a student is suspended, they're given a sheet of paper that tells them all the organizations they can call. Um, and one of the student organizations is, the, is an organization that I advocate with. Um, but I think oftentimes even just the local legal aid will, I've, I've seen it coming up where they're now, um, they, they typically call them education lawyers. And their, their main uh, objective is to help students in their suspension hearings. Usually students that have pretty severe ones, but they're oftentimes will have the type of education programs that you're referring to that might give a little bit more information. But I can also tell you, I've seen parents representing their kids in the hearings, and, and exactly that happens. You know, they come screaming out of the room, or they get really fired up before the hearing. So sometimes just having somebody else in the room who can have that conversation and can be that advocate and someone who's experienced doing that can go a long way to making sure that conversation doesn't get more heated than it has to. So it has its other downsides, but yeah. it has that benefit too. So. Thank you so much for pooling the research and your own thoughts in writing this book, which is so important in helping people who are not trying to take an alternative perspective on suspension and expulsion to look at it in another way. And I thought it was very um, spot on the three major sources of, of um, misbehavior, um, personal challenges, academic challenges, and disability. And the way that you talked about the bonds that are broken by suspension and expulsion. Because it helps, although your research, I haven't, I haven't read your book yet, but I have it now start tonight. Um, although your research, I'm assuming, is focused on black and white students, um, this helps us to look at it deeper from the perspective of just, do we view students as human beings anymore? In um, um, an educational environment where we are looking at education as fully quantitatable, we're not really looking at as much is how are we contributing as educators, as therapists, towards creating better human beings, better citizens, better community members, better brothers, sisters, neighbors? How are we contributing to that? Or are we, is our primary interest in how we're able to quantify achievement in a very limited way? So I'm very curious about how you view or what thoughts you have on how we can um, build those bonds that can't be remedied through legislation so that we can move further on this issue. At this point, I see across the country 
that expulsion and suspension really should be called what it is, a convenience for the administrators and for the teachers. It gets the student out of the way. It doesn't have to resolve the issue. It's not, the only time that I see it has a positive effect is when the student is suspended and goes into treatment, if that's what's needed. But most of the time, um, the, parent, the child is sitting at home and usually alone because the parents are working. So there's nothing to be learned by that. And you're absolutely right, they come back to school, they're further behind, not only in academic achievement, but in their ability to bond with their class, to bond with their teacher, to stay up with a rapidly moving curriculum. They've already, and the school is under no obligation to help them catch up. So we're in a really bad situation, and I'm wondering how a non-educator can help us fix it. <laughs> well, you, you said a lot there that almost gives me enough for a whole another lecture, but we don't have it the whole evening. But I, I think, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head, and, but I want to put one caveat out there. You know, <clears throat> a lot of times when I speak about this, there's the sense one has that I'm blaming teachers or principals. And I, no, not at all. I, I lay the blame largely at the feet of of school boards and state policy makers that over the last decade um, we've seen school budgets uh, slashed by as much as 20 25 percent in many states and still today 30 states in real dollar terms are funding their schools at a lower level than they did prior to the recession the tax revenues are back the education dollars are not classrooms are bigger teacher pay has not kept up with inflation right? and when we put when we ask teachers to do more with less, um, how can we expect them to take the time to deal with the situation that you're talking about? So the school puts them in an untenable situation quite often. That, that's, that's first of all. Um, so I don't blame, there's certainly bad actors, but as a whole, I don't blame the, I think teachers and, and principals are, for the most part, trying to make the best of a bad situation. But to your question, what we have is the problem of the standardization of children through NCLP. The idea that we can measure them through a test and we can standardize them or could have standardized them by 2014. Um, and that that's all that we cared about for those children. It put an enormous amount of time pressure uh, and other pressures on schools. And so the time that it really takes to deal with a child as a human is not a luxury that most school teachers have anymore. Now the new Every Student Succeeds Act theoretically provides some flexibility. The states can move in the other direction, and maybe some will. In fact, discipline is one of the factors that you can use to rank yourself on the new Every Student Succeeds Act. So there maybe is some movement there. Um, but since my son isn't listening, I mean, I think it's incredibly hard, right? My, I, I bought my wife a, a book, and, and I read it before I let her read it, uh, about uh, it was, I forget, someone here at, at one of the universities in New York about sort of the psychology of parenting discipline and um, how, and I think it goes to your part about humanity, hopefully we treat all of our own children as humans, and if that's really what you're doing, if that's really the goal, then actually rule number one is never make a decision about punishment quickly. Never. You should never do that. You don't understand why the child misbehaved. You may be acting out in anger yourself. You know, I know, and he said, I know when I haven't slept enough, I snap on him more than I should. And I feel sorry for teachers who have got 30 kids, 40 kids to deal with, right? Um, but it takes deliberate sort of human interaction and trying to figure out what's going on with that child. But when we tell teachers that, they're, that they may be fired, if their student test scores, you know, there's a lawsuit going on in New York over this now. If their student test scores don't go up quickly enough, they won't be tenured if they don't go up quickly enough, right? Their school's going to get turned into a charter, nothing against charter. If they don't go up quickly, what do we expect these teachers to do? So I, I, I think it takes far more time and attention to individual children than our current education policy structure allows. And so that's why I said this, is, this discipline conversation is a conversation about school quality. It's not just about discipline. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Miriam Nunberg, and um, I'm a former attorney for the Office for Civil Rights, and... Um, OCR, OCR. Here in New York? Yeah, 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 for 14 years. And um, so I did a lot of work on disproportionality and discipline, school-to-prison pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. 
and I was working part time and um, as a parent discovered that in my local school district there was a real shortage of middle schools. So I decided that I would start one and I used the, the charter process to actually start a charter middle school. And um, when we, we were determined that we would be a different kind of charter and, and I brought a lot of my experience at OCR to writing a very student protective discipline code and um, really trying to make sure that we built in a lot of supports that would, that would really try to address this issue. And um, I, I only was involved in running the school for the first couple of years, but what, this is really just sort of more a comment than a question, but in terms of trying to put this into action, it, it is, it's incredibly hard and, and you, you know, I mean, there are, there are many critiques against charter schools and, and I'm not actually, I actually agree with a lot of them, but one of the things that I think isn't, isn't really discussed is teachers do not get training in positive discipline and administrators don't really have an understanding a lot of times of, of, of how you create a positive school climate and unfortunately it really does cost a lot of money so when we wrote our charter one of the things that we were going to do was partner, partner with um, one of these kinds of organizations that does a lot of positive school discipline and it turned out that they were so prohibitively expensive that we couldn't hire them so I think that just in terms of a really important piece of this puzzle is funding because I think that when you go in as we did frankly probably very naively saying we're not going to suspend kids it, particularly in our charter situation where so many of the teachers are brand new out of college or maybe out of ed school um, you don't have you know in, in New York State the charter schools are actually funded something like six thousand dollars less per pupil um, and we weren't a big you know hedge funded charter school so w what it really came down to was the cost of implementing programs like that that it that we, we we brought in a mediation program and we thought that that would actually really try to help the um, you know proactive school discipline but what it came down to was that e e this is a this is this is a really, really, really important thing to do, but without funding, it, it's very, very difficult. And we, you end up with a very, very, very disruptive school environment if you, if you just start from the principle of don't suspend. So, you know, that's, that's just sort of my anecdote that I wanted yeah, to no, share. Yeah, no, I agree with that at all. I mean, it, it, is, it is, you know, ending suspension alone doesn't fix anything, and Fixing it costs money and programming, uh, and some states are putting resources there, but but not enough. Um, so no, I, yeah, I totally agree with with what you what you have to say there. I, I guess I, w I would add to go back to that, and there is a report which I'm sure many of you um, have seen. And it also depends on what you spend your money on. I think there was like 10 or 11 schools here in New York City, or maybe it was 14 that have more school resource officers than they do guidance counselors, right? So you're choosing to spend money on certain things, and I'll give you one anecdote, but it was a big deal in the national news this fall. On the same day, this past fall, uh, I'm forgetting the day, I think it was in early October, there were two young boys who brought a gun to school. One brought a gun to school in Somerville, South Carolina, and another one brought a gun to school in Tennessee. I can't remember that, Mount Juliet, I think it was. And the boy in South Carolina uh, fired from the fence at the officer and another elementary, uh, elementary age child. The child died. I don't think the officer was hit. But at the school in um, Tennessee, the guidance counselor had been trained in, in all of these issues. And on his way to shoot the school resource officer, he stopped by to tell her what he was going to do. It took her 45 minutes, but he laid the gun on her desk and he went home without shooting anyone. Now, you know, hey, that's an anecdote, but, you know, there's people that are trained to do these things and they make a difference. And when they're not there, had she not been there that morning, uh, I think that boy probably would have taken that gun and fired it at someone. And no amount of school resource officers on the premises would have prevented that firing. 
I see a lot of hands still, and I know um, we also, I just want to let everybody know, have a reception uh, next door, uh, which is uh, some nice cheese and crackers, which I think Rowan's very excited about, uh, and also some, uh, some spirits, as it were. So um, I think we'll take a couple more questions, and then I'd love to move it over there so we can have more informal discussions uh, with Derek and, and so. Going along this train of thought of trying to develop solutions here, because this does seem like an unsurmountable problem, um, a lot of people say that restorative justice is the way to go, and I haven't really heard too much of a critique about that system. How do you think that has been effective, and do you think that creates solutions to all the problems that you address in your book? Do you have any critiques of that system? I mean, I think, it, I, mean, I think first of all, in, in the same way that I say circumstances matter any time that we're going to suspend a student, I think the solution matters any time we talk about a positive uh, discipline environment. Um, you know, we're talking about a school that has a school with student populations that have a lot of those out-of-school factor challenges uh, going on. That sort of step number one is to try to address some of those other problems with counseling. You're not going to make these kids not poor, right? You're not going to take away a divorce, but having counselors there, you know, forget positive behavioral, forget all that fancy stuff, like someone that that child can, can, can communicate with is important. Um, you know, there's other schools that have, you know, very uh, lower incidence of those problems. So I do think it's going to vary uh, from place to place. I guess I would just for the sake of time point you to, to Jason Nance at the University of Florida. He's really been doing comprehensive work on this for the ABA. Uh, he's been doing task force and town halls over the past year, and so Jason Nance has some great work, I think, that, that works through this, you know, the panoply of, of solutions there, because I think they do vary. Take those two questions here, and then we'll close it. Good evening, and um, thank you for your remarks. My name is Portia Allen Kyle. I actually work for the ACLU of New Jersey. Um, the question that I have, one of your reforms you mentioned um, that when discipline is extremely harsh, it, there may be a claim to be made by all students of the school. Um, and to me, that there's a clear role for social science there. You know, I'm sure uh, many of us know that courts are not always open to the wisdom that social science provides to us. And I was wondering if you um, could give some insight into some of the obstacles that you see from a making the claim perspective and bringing this um, and getting courts and administrators, I mean, even school administrators, there's tons of data on this that they just willingly w decide to ignore. Um, on a regular basis, and so what some of the what some of those obstacles may look like. Well, in your state, I think there's far fewer obstacles than any other in the United States of America. Um, I'm sure you know David Shiara. He and I were we constant sort of text buddies of this that and another talking about these things. I know you know they've never include you know David in, in New York worries so much about the sort of biggest macro macro issue of the funding formula that he doesn't. And this isn't a critique of him, but that's not what they do. Uh, let's get into the to the granular of this. But I think that uh, the precedent in, in New Jersey is particularly positive on this. If you look back at, I think it's the 1998 Abbott decision or the 99, um, where they actually ordered alternative schools, but they weren't the alternative schools that we think about today. What they were really talking about were well-resourced, small classrooms, support service. Um, uh, environments for the most challenged students. Not students who had been disciplined, but the students who had the most need. And they had actually ordered that as a remedy for some of those children. Now, alternative schools have become something different over time. But I just point to that example to say that there was a taste early on and at least helpful precedent there to suggest that the school does need to take on these sort of soft variables in schools if that's what's necessary for students uh, to do well. The difference in the claim I'm articulating uh, and I think the data supports it now, is that, um, you know, instead of ostracizing those children at the point at which they're in such a hard situation they can't come back, is to actually bring those sorts of things into the regular school environment to make a, a better school environment for, for all the children. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I think New Jersey, if I was picking a state, would probably be one of the first ones I would think about. Although Governor Christie signed that that no more expulsions for elementary school students, which will give them something to parade around, I suppose, if they were to be sued. Yes. Hi, this is an actual perfect segue into my question because my question for you, 
and I may have missed this before I walked in, but you mentioned that the Minnesota Supreme Court has a really positive case in the books, and of course New Jersey uh, has some helpful precedent for this issue. Um, but I'm wondering which states have the worst precedent, in your opinion, and which ones are um, the most problematic in regards to policy? Well, there's about, there's about 23 states that have never recognized any sort of positive education right at all. So uh, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, um, yeah, I, won't, I won't go through them all. So there's, there's a handful of them. But what we have are other ones that are in the more moderate position. They've got a positive decision, but could you really leverage it for much of anything? I think South Carolina is one of those states that has a positive education constitutional decision on the books, it'd be pretty darn hard, I think, at this point to, to leverage it. They can't even get their school funding claim fully adjudicated. Um, New York had some state court, and I never actually relocated them for this book. I meant to go back and look at them. There were some claims, not school quality claims, but individual student claims that said, I have a constitutional right, see, you know, the Constitution, and therefore you ought to meet higher scrutiny. And um, the lower courts had rejected that. That case, I don't, I don't think that ever got to a higher court there. And I think those case, cases may have pre predated CFE. Um, so in any event, I mean, without, without sitting down and thinking through them all, I think that, you know, New York is better than most, but not great. I think New Jersey is really great. South Carolina really stinks. Uh, you know, Florida is non-existent. Uh, you know, so it, it, it is a, it, it is a, and so, you know, that, that, that's what I would say. Yeah. Uh, I'd love everyone to join me in thanking uh, Derek Black for being here this evening. And I also want to give everybody else a hand. I think the questions and the, and the sharing was really, uh, really enhanced uh, the whole discussion. So thank you. Thank um, you. Just a couple of uh, uh, um, points uh, before we depart for next door. Um, if you are an attorney or an educator um, and you'd like to get continuing ed credits for this, I just have to, there's a couple of formal things we have to go through. So don't run over there before you come and see us in the back um, to check off those points. Um, and also, uh, please uh, feel free to go to our website. Over the next couple of days, we'll have the recording from this event. Um, I'm going to ask Derek on record so we can make sure it gets done, but I'd love to get your wife's paper when that gets published so we can um, both sort of talk about events that are coming up in the future from our perspective, but we also try to put resources on the site to connect people. So if you happen to be at organizations that are doing work in this area, please connect with us at the educationlawcollaborative.com. Uh, we'd love to uh, get the information out there from a variety of different perspectives. So please uh, feel free to send us your information. We're happy to put it up on our website. So thank you everybody for coming this evening and have a great night. Please join us next door. Thank you.